Social Music Talk with Alex Cosper. Today I'm talking with a radio legend who's been all over America, yeah. Brian Schock. I don't know about the legend, but I'm a legend <laughs> in my own mind. Well, I think within the radio community, the alternative radio community, you're pretty well known. No, if you say so. Because you've worked <laughs> at, uh, you, you've been a program director at some big name alternative stations. 91X. Yeah. That was in, in fact, you've been there like three times, right? Or That's something like twice. that? Twice. I've okay. been there twice, KGB three times, uh, which is not alternative. Right. Um, and uh, the other station, uh, KNAC, which isn't around anymore, I was there twice. They were kind of metal. Yeah, not kind of <laughs> metal. They were metal. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll get into that. Yeah. So we're going to kind of race through your timeline okay. here and, and talk about this because, um, you know, radio, specifically alternative radio, but you could say, uh, beyond that as well, um, had its heyday, some, uh, a lot of historians like myself will mm -hmm. argue, <laughs> in the 80s and 90s. Yeah, I would say that's probably true. Okay, and then in, in the 2000s, it became a different world because of the internet and um, just all kinds of new uh, platforms for music. Yeah. And I would say consolidation probably Con changed yes, things. Corporate lot, consolidation, lots of mergers mm -hmm. that merged into huge piles of debt <laughs> that they're still trying to figure out. But I guess iHeart has paid down some of that debt and now wants to go public again. I heard uh, about that. And then Intercom still has a, a lot of debt to deal with. But you know, those are the top companies. You, you were at Cumulus as well, KFOG in San Francisco. And so they're they're part of the big debt club, right? I think all of those big companies got themselves deep into it because at the uh, you know around 2000, late 90s, 2000, 2001 is when all the consolidation started and things were good financially and there was a lot of ov overpaying for properties. So it's like the 1920s, lots of optimism. Yeah, let's just go out and buy everything. Let's go buy everything. But unfortunately, they were buying when the prices were high. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and those prices <laughs> never came back no. to what they were. No, they did not. Okay, but uh, I, you know what? I documented this. It's even in this magazine right here. Um, when j Core bought 91X in 1996, it was for $155 million. Wow. That's Holy smoke. Pretty that amazing, right? <laughs> that wasn't just for 91X. It would, it had right, it was a package. Yeah. It probably had 690 in there, too. Yeah. And, um, wow. But do do radio valuations for San Diego go that high anymore? Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. No, I, I, don't, I don't know the exact numbers, but I can tell you there's nothing like that. Okay. So that's the backdrop of the story we're about to tell here. But let's get into the story. You started at 91X before it was alternative. I did. In 82. And uh, tell us a little bit about that those early days from 82 to 85 at 91X? Well, the first couple of months that I was there, it was actually a format that was uh, a guy named Frank Felix was was behind, and it was about 200 titles of what we would now call classic rock, and it was so boring. <laughs> um, and it was I was actually thrilled when a few months later it flipped to what was the rock of the 80s. Mm -hmm. And Rick Carroll, who was the, the, the guy who got that going up in Los Angeles at, K, at K Rock was brought in. And so As those first consultant. three years, yes, exactly. And he, he helped get the thing off the ground. And that was an amazing time and, and a whole heck of a lot of fun. But um, I was, uh, I felt like I could have been doing more. And uh, the format itself, although I liked it a lot, was not really my personal taste at that time. Which was what? Uh, more into rock. Okay. I was more into rock and I liked harder edge rock. I mean, I was, I was a kid. I was literally... Deep purple. Oh, uh, <laughs> or deep. I like Deep Purple, yeah, but we're probably talking Harder. more. Yeah, definitely. Okay. I mean, Metallica was just getting started, Guns N' Roses. Black Sabbath. And, yeah, no, like Sabbath, it's absolutely. So okay. I went over to KGB and originally worked there part-time. Uh, 85 is when I went over there. Worked there part-time for a little while, kind of figuring I'd be able to get a full-time job, and I did. And stayed at KGB for five years, and actually uh, that's where I got into the programming side because I programmed a show called Metal Shop. Uh, from there, I ended up at KNAC up in Los Angeles, which was a straight right. uh, hard rock metal station. Was that based in Long Beach? It was based in Long Beach. Okay. Yeah. So KNAC, but it, Long but it Beach, covered Los Orange Angeles. County and Los Angeles. Yeah, en enough of L.A. Yeah. Um, not down into the valley, but um, yeah, it was, that was a legendary station. That was a, that was a great time. Uh, I was the music director at that station, so stepping a little deeper into the, 
into the programming side. Were and you into breaking records, breaking acts? Oh, yeah. Um, okay. Actually, when I first got to KNAC, I came to the program director. Her name is Pam Edwards. And I said, look, I've been playing this band that, um, that I really think is going to be huge. And I've been playing them on my show in San Diego. And they've got a new album out. They're signed to, uh, to Atlantic uh, or Atco or whatever it was. And I really think we should play this band. And she was very hesitant. I don't know. This is a little too heavy. Is this, is this, can this get us ratings, et cetera, et cetera. And I remember bringing the band. Uh, they came in through the Long Beach area. They played in front of like 70 people. I grabbed a couple of the jocks, brought them to the show. I said, you got to see these guys. They're going to be freaking huge. And um, anyway, uh, that band was Pantera. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they did become uh, the biggest thing in metal. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, so she did eventually come around. But, yeah, I mean, there were bands like that that, that I definitely... Alice in Chains. Mm-hmm. Um, Nick Turzo, who worked with uh, Bill Silva here, I believe. I may be wrong about that, but he was definitely worked with one of the promoters. Ended up in A&R for Columbia. Called me up because we had a relationship and said, Hey, I've got this band from Seattle named Alice in Chains, and I'm going to send you a four-song EP, and I want you to pick a single for me. And he sent it to me, and I listened to it, and I said, undoubtedly, Man, Man in the Box is the song. Uh, I'm not going to sit here and say I broke Alice in Chains. I cannot claim that, but I certainly was along the, the path of, mm-hmm. of helping them along. You um, were in so, the supply chain, as they absolutely. say, in the corporate world. There you go. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I, there's a lot of—I love music, and there have been a number of artists that I've stepped mm-hmm. out on early. So. Okay, so from KNAC, you were there for a year, and then you went to um, Baltimore and was, was a yeah. program director. Yeah, I was actually at KNAC for, for uh, about a year and a half, and, and okay. I, then I was offered a program director job at, uh, at WHBY. It was called The Underground, and it was kind of the East Coast version of KNAC. Okay. Um, and, so, and I did spend a year there. I, uh, <laughs> that didn't work out because uh, the, uh, the general manager, or, or the, um, there were five owners, and I interviewed with four of them, and the guy I didn't interview with was the prime guy. Okay. His name was Dick Wynn, and he talked uh-huh. like this. Hey, I got a problem with you. I got a bone to pick with you. <laughs> and, he, and he was in real estate and ho- uh, owned horses. He didn't know anything about radio. Uh, so anyway, that, that didn't work out, and that's <laughs> fine. You know, I'm, I, I hold yeah. no ill will. Right. Um, but I, uh, I had two young kids at the time and, and was married, so I ended up in Milwaukee at uh, Laser in Milwaukee as the music director. And I know that station because I programmed against it, kind of, oh, when, when I was at WLUM from 97 oh, yeah. to 98. Oh, cool. Uh, so I was, um, I was aware of Laser, and they were the kings of the market as far as yeah. guitar music. It was a, it was a great time. And the, th- the interesting thing about <laughs> Milwaukee, I don't know if it's still like that, but at that time, they were about four or five years behind. So was it very yeah. easy to predict what was going <laughs> yeah, to happen right, because right. I'd already lived it. <laughs> it was kind of like you were doing Rock 40 at the end of the Rock 40 era, right? Yeah. <laughs> kind of. Maybe. I'll tell you what. You, yeah. you talk about breaking music or <laughs> playing new music. Yeah. When I was at KNAC, <laughs> I played Plush by Stone Temple Pilots okay. very early. Mm-hmm. Then I went to HVY, and I played Plush by Stone Temple Viol- Pilots, which at that point was still pretty new. When I went to Laser, because they were behind... I played Plush by Stone Temple Pilots. I actually played it first on three different stations over several years. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> and you know what? I, I think it was a big hit in 93, wasn't it? it, it an I, alternative. Yeah, I don't, I don't yeah. recall exactly the year, but it was something like that. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I ended up uh, then leaving uh, to go back to KNAC as the program director. Um, I was only in Milwaukee for six months. And uh, so is everybody from California that yeah, goes there. It was <laughs> brutal, brutal. I got there in November and I left there in May. And when, and when I left LA the first time, I said, I'm never coming back to this place. I don't <laughs> want to live here. And uh, when they called and said, Hey, do you want to come back as a program director? Because Greg Steele was leaving, uh, okay. who was the program director. Uh, and I, they wanted to know if I want to go where it was warm again. I said, Yes, please, now. <laughs> it would be wonderful. And were they rocking harder by that point? Uh, it was still kind of the same, and yeah. uh, but they d- during that time period they were sold, and eventually the company that ended up buying them wanted to uh, sell it again. Um, the, now we're approaching where the, the prices are starting to go out of control, mm-hmm. and so it was sold and turned Spanish, which was a sad day. Um, oh, yeah, there were the, the, the fan base for that radio station was huge and still exists twenty five years later. As a, a website, right? But it does. But the fan base, you, you go online. Mm-hmm. Um, there are people who are still crying for it to come back. 
Um, it, it really was extremely impactful. And if you think about the fact that that station was around from 86 to 95, mm -hmm. th those were prime years oh, for, yeah. for metal, hair metal, just all the, th the thrash metal all scene. All kinds of rock. Everything. Yeah. It, and, and L.A. was where a lot of that was happening. So yep, it was, it was very cool. Um, I went from uh, KNAC. I got an opportunity to go to Denver and put a station on that and um, was probably the first aggressive alternative station. My friend Malcolm Riker, who's in this magazine mm -hmm. right here, the the ninety one X magazine, yeah. um, a VA tribute, vir virtually alternative, used to be part of Album Network, and it, we put out a tribute album, <laughs> tribute. a tribute magazine yes. in twenty uh, twenty o two, and that was almost to celebrate your twenty year anniversary of being alternative in San Diego, yep. which would have been two thousand three. Yeah, the January of two thousand three. So. Uh, anyway, uh, we had been trying to figure out because we know Malcolm worked with me at KNAC and we were looking and seeing that the grunge thing was happening and what's the next step here. And, uh, so we created this format that was more aggressive type of alternative music and a lot of things that were not being played on the radio at that time. And it, when I, the station was called 92X, it was KNRX in Denver mm -hmm. and, and it had a very small signal, but it was incredibly impactful. It was one of the most fun times I've ever had in radio. It was there was no uh, there was no uh, social media at that time. This was grassroots, word of mouth, people showing up. Um, we did something called the exceptionally cool up and coming concert uh, up and coming bands for hardly any cash concert series, where it was just basically your dollar show. But we were bringing new acts into Denver, which was very much a city that was open to new music. I, I love San Diego. I've lived here for most mm -hmm. of my life. It's a great town, but I cannot sit here and look you in the eye and tell, tell you that it's a great concert town, nor is it a great town, has it ever been a great town for, for record sales, which, of course, doesn't really exist anymore. Mm -hmm. But it's, it, it just hasn't been. Denver is a great music town. It is not Austin. Probably because it's near Boulder, which is a great college town, right? Yeah, it's just, just a, people are really open. Bands go through there like three times a year and are able to to draw every time. Just people want to go. Denver's a great city, period. And we had a, a, amazing success there. Somebody else, um, I forget what the term was. Uh, um, yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm getting off track here. But So you were in Denver for just about a year, and then you went on to Jones Radio which Network. Which was also based in Denver at the time okay. and ultimately turned into Westwood One. And you stayed in the rock realm because you programmed a rock alternative for It was that, really right? kind of a triple A. Okay. Um, kind of a big head Todd and the Monsters yes, type. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. it was, we were from Boulder. It was, it, was, it was that kind of thing. But that was a national format. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh -huh. it was one of these things where you have... Uh, markets around the country that can't really afford to staff and program, etc. So it's a syndicated program. Yeah, service, but it's right? it all it's all happening live at the time. Okay. And right. uh, and and when you're on the air doing that, literally you you uh, record yourself saying the call letters of the radio station and you send it off to them, and a tone would hit and it would be your voice saying you know whatever the call letters were in Florida, and then you'd roll in from there live. Okay. And it was a very strange way to do it. So it was radio. a mix of live and automation, right, in a way? Yes. Yeah. Automation on their end. Yeah. What I was doing on my end was all live. Right. It, was, it was actually a lot of fun. But during the time period that I was at 92X, I got the attention of JCOR, and um, they actually had tried to hire me in Denver. That did not work out. Um, they had come to San Diego. They had purchased 91X, and I obviously had been here, know the market, uh, I had their attention. They knew, at least in their minds, thank you very much, um, they thought I was a good programmer, and they called me up and said, we've screwed 91X up, please come and fix it. <laughs> All right. Well, that's, that's a great way to come back. <laughs> so well, that's then, a great way to come back.